Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rick Rule. I'll be moderating two hours of panel discussions from notable CEOs of junior mining issuers uh, located throughout North America. I have the extreme good fortune today to interview in the first session uh, Rick Van Neuenhaus from Contango Ores, Julian Traeger from Kotec, Ali Haji from Ion Energy and Doug Ramshaw from Minera Alamos. Uh, these are people with a wide range of experience and we're going to talk to them uh, in a very sort of varied sense about the opportunities and risks that they see in various aspects of the mining industry investments. So I'm going to cut right into it. The first question uh, is going to revolve around commodities. These gentlemen are all involved in searching for and potentially producing various types of commodities. And I'd like each of them to give an overview of what commodity markets that they are in and why. Rick, I'm going to begin with you. Contango, uh, I know from experience, is mostly involved in the gold business. And you have been mostly involved in the gold business for most of your career. Talk to us about gold, the opportunities, the risks. Why now? Well, I think gold's a, at, a, at a great place to invest in for investors. Um, you know, we're, we're still printing money. We just passed, a, in the United States, just passed a $700, $700 billion bill. Printing money is, is what uh, results in inflation. Uh, the Fed's got so many so many levers it can pull, but it's it's not just about uh, interest rates. Uh, and so I'm, I'm a gold bull. Uh, we are going to see inflation. I know we're going to talk about that, but... Uh, uh, I think the, the the moment we're at right now, uh, with the Fed already starting to to uh, moderate its language and the market uh, wanting the the, mar the Fed to mar moderate its language, I think gold's in a great place. It's uh, it's going to take off uh, to uh, significantly higher levels. It's it's gone through a nice consolidation phase here uh, between seventeen and eighteen hundred dollars, and uh, so I, th I think we're just in a very good very good position to see uh, the gold price move up. Uh, as uh, not just the U.S., but the, the world still uh, figures out uh, how much money we actually need in the system. Julian, uh, throughout your career, you've been involved in lots and lots and lots of different metals. Uh, you are basically now in the batteries metals business. Tell us why and tell us what you see in that business. Seems like Julian's lost his connection. Let's move on. Uh, Ali, the same question for you. You've been involved in several commodities in your career. You're in lithium business now. Indeed. What do you see as the outlook for lithium? Why are you in the business? What risks do you see in lithium? We've been in the business uh, for ION in the last uh, sort of five years, so 2017, mm -hmm. when I co-founded the company. I think uh, to, to echo what uh, Rick was saying in terms of government expenditure and printing money, uh, a lot of what we've seen throughout the pandemic has uh, been governments printing money or incentivizing a clean green energy revolution. Mm -hmm. And so lithium continues to be of demand. Uh, we see that there is a scarcity in terms of uh, lithium supply. And being the lithium business allows us to, to somewhat close that gap, but also um, being junior explorers in the proximity, uh, or, or rather in the jurisdiction that has a close proximity to largest consumers, uh, for us uh, is a, a value proposition that we believe um, uh, lithium can continue to play. Finally, uh, Doug Ramshaw, Manera Alamos, uh, precious metals business focused on gold. Uh, tell us why you chose the gold business? Is it because you think gold's going to go up? Is it because it lowers your cost of capital to be in the gold business? Talk to us about gold and Minera Alamos. Yeah, I, I mean, to echo a lot of what Rick said, uh, I mean, there, there are obvious points about gold. I, I think looking back to 2020, gold demonstrated that its uh, exposure in your portfolio can stabilize a portfolio during very volatile times. Um, we saw two very good years of gold uh, gold price appreciation uh, before last year's period of stabilization. I I would think that gold this year, uh, despite everyone thinking, well, inflation's running rampant, why is gold not moving? Is actually done exactly why, you know, what and why you have some exposure to it in your portfolio. So uh, I think current prices are very healthy for having good margins for well-run operations, um, you know, and, you know, the world is with the money printing that we have right now, you know, we're still probably 20, 25 percent below uh, record highs in inflation adjusted terms in gold. And, uh, you know, there's 
there's potential to see margin expansion if we see see a, a move in gold prices. But in the meantime, these are pretty healthy levels. Uh, I think uh, the the real risk in the gold space right now is is we're seeing the inflationary effects on costs, both capex and op costs, and we haven't necessarily seen it translate through to the gold price yet. So I think a lot of the sector are, are certainly going to be hoping for that second leg. Julian, can you hear us? Or are you still... Uh, apologies, ladies and gentlemen, Julian Traeger, uh, an important panelist, is having some connectivity issues. So we'll return to him when we have the opportunity. Gentlemen, I'm going to move on to a discussion to the extent that we can uh, about capital markets and the economy. Uh, obviously, capital markets are a concern of everybody's. Um, uh, Julian, you're with us. Can you hear me? I'm coming and going, but thank you. Yes, I can hear you. Let me try this then. I'm going to return to the, the former question, uh, which is to say commodities. You've been involved in a lot of co commodity markets in your career. Currently, you're focused on battery metals. If you could tell us a bit about why and what you see the opportunities and the risks being in that sector. Sure. I mean, we're very keen on battery metals because we can see 250 giga factories being built uh, to supply the batteries for the future and they need lots more uh, material and mines plus you can see the breakdown of global supply chains and a lot of the uh, metals which china uh, is controlling are now going to be needed in other parts of the world so there's going to be much more demand as the global just-in-time system breaks down so we are very keen um, on this area, including, uh, you know, obviously base metals. So while we have you, Julian, I'm going to start the next question with you before we lose you, <laughs> uh, which is a capital markets question. Obviously, with the TSC, TSXV resource index uh, off like a boulder off a bridge uh, and increasing concerns uh, about the broad economy, what do you see as in terms of both opportunities and risks in either capital markets and or the broad economy? And uh, Julian, I want to start with you since we have you. Sounds like we don't have it. Well, I mean, we oh, we see this as we see, we see this as a buying opportunity. We think that there's good. It's a good entry point because we um, we've had a great reversal, and we um, you know see uh, the sh the shift to a circular economy and recycling uh, with technology, which we are occupying as a very interesting growth area. Jillian, do you see the sell-off in, ca in uh, junior capital markets being reflective of things in, in the broad economy, uh, or do you see it as an aberration, given your longer-term outlook? I think the uh, junior market um, looks relatively undervalued because people have been moving towards liquidity more recently, so I think it represents a very interesting buying opportunity. Uh, Ali, I want to ask you the same range, range, range of questions. There's turmoil in capital markets. Some would suggest there's turmoil in the broad economy. <clears throat> Talk to us about uh, both the risks and rewards that you see in capital markets, mining capital markets in particular, and in the broad economy. Absolutely. Uh, in terms of the risk that we see today, I think we've had a number of companies, uh, irrespective of jurisdiction, as well as uh, stage of either exploration, development, or ultimate production or production uh, ca capacity, uh, be overvalued to some degree. Uh, there was a fair bit of capital that uh, individuals had either held on to or, or were able to accumulate on the back of the pandemic. Uh, the crypto run obviously allowed uh, a number of individuals to invest in, in the same remit. But I think today where we stand, uh, there, there are companies that have a value proposition that can be realized for investors. As far as the macro sort of uh, uh, industry or mining investment uh, industry is concerned, um, I, I think uh, we, we're seeing inflows of capital, uh, and that's a good thing for all of us that are involved in the resource space. Uh, but beyond that, I think um, we just have to pay attention to, to, to finding fundamental value in organizations and management teams that are executing uh, across uh, the, the, their mandate. Do you think, uh, Ali, you again, do you think that the turmoil that we're experiencing in junior capital markets is reflective of the broad economy, or do you think it's unfairly discounting as an example, the chances of recession relative to uh, impending supply-side shortages? 
I, I would say it's, it's across the board. So it, what we're seeing in terms of losses um, across the market uh, or, or the, the capital markets has been uh, agnostic. So we're not looking primarily at uh, resources. We've seen some capital flow back into resource uh, sector, but we're also seeing individuals, like we stated, uh, looking for liquidity. And so a number of exits across uh, the industry, uh, across uh, various uh, different industries, has resulted in an ultimate uh, decline in the capital markets as we see them today. Doug, I'm going to ask you the same round of questions. Capital markets opportunities, capital markets risk, the broad economy. Do you think that gold shares have been, as an example, uh, unfairly punished? Do you think that uh, companies that are on the exploration basis rather than large companies have been unfairly punished in the sell-off and tertiary markets? Um, no, I, I don't think so, Rick. I, I think... You know, we're almost two years into a into a decline. Uh, you know, we probably saw well peak gold in you know August September in terms of margins, and and it's been contraction of margins ever since. So it's not just um, juniors that are struggling right now with with performance. I mean, we're seeing it amongst the the major constituents of the of the GDX as well. So um, obviously. The, the biggest difference is when juniors are struggling, um, it can be harder to raise capital uh, to execute on their plan. I think one of the biggest problems at the lower end of the, the market is we, we have too many companies. I've long lamented we have too little capital spread around too thinly. And then we wonder, why do we not get anything done? Um, I'd love to see a moratorium on new company creation. Um, it will never happen. but. Uh, so, no, I, I think uh, it's across the board, but one of the positives is, I think, from a global fund flow perspective, um, there is uh, woefully inadequate investment in the commodity space, space at large relative to um, broad, broader industries that all require the very commodities that we're, we're looking at mining and developing. So, I think as you know, the world settles down. Um, you know, we're, we're obviously seeing this big decline in copper, for example, recently, but that hasn't changed the dynamic that's out there in a couple of years' time in terms of major supply supply issues that are facing the copper market. So I think we've all got to breathe a little and realize that commodities are the bedrock of so many of these industries out there. Um, and there needs to be greater exposure, I think, to, to commodity investing. Rick, same question for you. You're, you're a capital yeah. markets veteran of many cycles. Tell us what you see in terms of opportunities and risks, both in capital markets and in the broad economy. Yeah, I mean, obviously, the, the junior sector is struggling. I think the uh, the average value for an ounce of gold that uh, companies are getting in their resource categories is $30 an ounce, which is, I don't know if it's at an all-time low, but it's pretty close to an all-time low. So obviously that's a good buying opportunity, and to sort of follow on with with, uh, with what Doug was just saying about too many companies in the in the space, I think we need to have consolidation in the business, and that's one of the strategies we're going to execute. We have we have a very small amount of shares outstanding. We're a, we've been a well structured company. We're um, we're going to be in cash flow here in, in another year or so uh, with our our joint venture partner and. And so we're going to take advantage of that. We think it's, you know, uh, like any any buyer in a in a down market, um, you want to take advantage of of the situation. So that's that's our business plan. You know, guys, I'm going to ad lib here for a second uh, because you've brought up something of interest. Some years ago, about 15 years ago, I assigned a young intern. That's financial speak for slave uh, to pull 25 uh, in those days VSE issuers uh, at random look at the balance sheets and the income statements uh, and tell me what he saw that was interesting uh, with nothing particular in mind i just wanted to see the way the young man thought uh and i'm not saying that 25 is a representative sample but the 25 that he pulled had uh, median general and administrative expenses at 64 percent of capital raised uh, which is to say out of 25 the median spent 64 percent on gna and uh, <laughs> the balance on the property so your comment with regards to a plethora of issues uh, I, I think is probably the single greatest challenge facing the junior industry sorry for the editorial but i couldn't resist that one <laughs> statement which i thought might bring some smile to various lips um, i want to move on 
to a discussion of inflation. Uh, inflation has been regarded for years as the friend of the miners uh, in the sense that it uh, raises at least the nominal uh, prices that are paid for commodities. But inflation can be the enemy, too. We're starting to see inflation in the supply chain uh, drive, as an example, uh, capital expenditures, mine construction costs crazy. And we're now beginning to see uh, inflation, in particular in the form of higher wages and energy uh, prices, uh, impact the income statement of various mining companies. So I want to talk to you about your out for, uh, outlook for inflation and how you see inflation uh uh, acting in the opportunities and the risks that you face. And, and Rick, I'm going to start with you. Uh, talk to me about inflation relative to Contango, a, a gold explorer and soon-to-be producer. Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, we're, we just issued a, a feasibility study uh, where our guidance had previously been a you know, year, a year plus, maybe a year, two year guidance was $130 million of capital uh, to execute on our project. Um, and it was low capital because we're not building a mi mine, or sorry, a mill in a tailings facility. So we weren't really building a lot, but regardless, you still see the effects of inflation. Our capital number is now 180. And we, you know, there's always been a little change in scope. Uh, we had, you know, we're going to buy a bunch of uh, highway trucks rather than uh, lease the highway trucks. So that's, a, you know, there's some extra capital for that. But, you know, apples to apples, we probably saw close to a 30% increase in capital over a year, 18 month sort of period. Right. You know, so not like 10 years, but a, a modest amount of time. So that's real. And obviously Newmont and I am gold and all the, all the, all the guys who've been uh, uh, updating their capital numbers. Uh, you know, it's, it's a real, it's a real, it's a real number. So it's not going away. Um, uh, it'll take time for it to go away. We may be in a stagflation period um, where it takes 10 years. We don't, and we don't have a, a Paul Volcker in the fed. So, <laughs> um, it might take longer. Um, and then you, you combine that with what's going on in the, uh, uh, in the uh, transition to alternative energy or non-carbon based energy and transportation. That's just a big inflationary pressure that's going to be with us probably for the next 20, 30 years. I don't, you know, it's, it's not, uh, it's not going to be short lived. So yeah, inflation's here. It's real. Um, I think we're the benefactor of, uh, as a company because we have a low amount of capital to raise. It's off of a low, much lower base. If we were building a, a mill at our own project and a tailings facility, our capital would probably be six or seven hundred million. So, yeah, it's there. It's real. I'm 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 thankful that we have a, a relatively low amount of capital to raise. Julian, are you with us? Can you hear us? It appears not. So let's. Uh... <laughs> But let's move on to Ali. I want to ask you the same question. The impact and perhaps the benefit of inflation uh, with regards to <clears throat> both, uh, well, you, you could do exploration expense too, uh, exploration expense, development expense, and then finally, uh, operational expense. Uh, what do you see with inflation? How do you expect to benefit from it? What are the risks that you're dealing with? The risks that we see today obviously have to do with uh, very much what uh, Rick mentioned, which is, you know, your exploration costs uh, tend to increase uh, your, your cost on the ground as far as uh, de-risking your projects tends to increase as well. Uh, we've actually scaled back on uh, a number of travel activities because, let's be honest, um, looking at air affairs around the world, you start to see <laughs> increments that are uh, really unaffordable. And we're moving back to this pre-pandemic uh, model, which is uh, Zoom related. And so we, we continue to, to, to explore opportunities to, to tell our story and market uh, with uh, various different mediums. But I think uh, exploration for us will continue to, to press on. Uh, the fact that we have a team in country, as far as ION is concerned, uh, allows us to execute in country without uh, seeing those uh, inflationary measures or, or costs really add up. Uh, and, and beyond that, I think um, uh, inflation, as uh, Rick mentioned, is here to stay. So we have to be well prepared and, and ensure that that's uh, built into our, uh, our, 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 our financials uh, going forward. It's <clears throat> interested me in looking at the lithium space, uh, at the impact that inflation is beginning to have in terms of inputs for the uh, SQMs and the Albemarle's of the world. It isn't just the upfront capital costs, but rather the operating costs too, uh, increasing wages, increasing social rents, uh, 
Mm -hmm. uh, it, it would appear that inflation is deviling, is being a devil to us twice. Are you seeing that among your larger producing peers in the lithium space? Indeed, we are, and I think you know the vast majority of uh, EV manufacturers today have contracts that allow them to buy lithium uh, and essentially battery metals at a, at a price that is contracted. Uh, we're seeing today prices of lithium carbonate equivalent uh, trading at multiples of what it would have been uh, you know three years ago uh, and part of that is indeed that inflationary uh, measure so as you look to increase your 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 uh, uh, your opex uh, you will also have an increment in prices and i think that's why we need more lithium producers coming online uh, to help us uh, move towards this clean uh, green future and doug uh, talk to us about inflation uh inflation in any aspect that you want to discuss relative to Monero Alamos. Yeah, I, I'm actually going to start by it's a mining panel. So someone's got to mention the Lasson curve. Um, you know, we need we need a lot of metals in our future. And, um, and so a lot of companies focus on that front peak of the Lasson curve. And I wish more traveled to the far peak of it. But when you actually look in this current environment we're in, you know, it's you almost feel like it's a fool's errand. I would not want to be a company having to think about committing six, seven hundred million dollars to a project with the uncertainty of costs moving forward. You, you've obviously seen some that are kind of pot committed on those decisions, like Argonaut at Magina or Cote Lake uh, for Iron Gold. You're seeing other ones that are at least able to to determine. Okay, we've got to shut that that down, like B2 did recently on on a development project. I, from Monero's perspective. I think we're fortunate in that we can, we're small enough and young enough that we can be more nimble. Um, on top of that, we approach things from a very low capex perspective. We built our first mine in the middle of a pandemic for 10 million US. Our next two projects are roughly 25 million capex pro and 35 million capex projects. So a banker at CIBC said to me at the beginning of the year, like your business model actually might be perfectly suited for this environment. In fact, I, I often say I embrace the current challenges right now because I think it shines a spotlight on low capital intensity. You know, if we were to suffer a 30% increase in CapEx over our next two projects, it's annoying, absolutely, but it's 20 million US. It doesn't create a funding shortfall. So I think we're fortunate that we can, we're small enough, we can be nimble. Um, but you know inflation is absolutely there in mexico where we are at least fuel inputs uh are largely in you know okay because the government of mexico address uh fuel price movements with a rolling average of three years so um so we haven't seen major input prices uh input uh changes yet um but as everyone has said on the panel and i agree you know these inflation rate pressures are here to stay so, um, you know, that's obviously an ongoing challenge for everyone in the sector. It's probably worth noting that uh, people who operate in non-North American jurisdictions, even if they operate in Canada, perhaps, benefit from a stronger U.S. dollar relative to domestic currency, which is to say that the United States has done a pretty good job of offloading inflation on hapless peers, uh, where your inputs are, as an example, in pesos, but you sell your product in relatively strong U.S. dollar terms. Uh, I, I want to move on to probably the three most controversial let, uh, letters in the English language right now. Uh, that is E, S, and G. Uh, I'll start by saying that my own experience has been that G uh, governance is really a function of trying to moderate disputes between E and S because everyone's definition of what constitutes ESG seems to be different. Uh, we used to call it corporate social responsibility. Uh, I remember myself 10 years trying to change the focus to corporate social opportunity, largely unsuccessfully. Uh, so away from the editorials, uh, I want to begin uh, a discussion uh, about ESG, which, uh, where do you see the opportunities? Where do you see the risks? What special challenges and opportunities do you face? Rick, you've operated in Alaska successfully, uh, I would say, in the context of ESG for a very long time. As an example, you're very close to uh, indigenous and native communities in Alaska, which have a lot of power. So I want to lead the discussion of ESG, of ESG with you, but you can take it anywhere you want. You don't need to confine yourself to the native corporations. 
Yeah, no, it's um, it's obviously very topical, as you say. I, I think you made the front the cover of the uh, Economist, so uh, um, it, it's. I think it got ahead of itself, and uh, I think there's been a lot of you know greenwashing that's that's gone on with the big corporations, and I think it's. Um, I think that's going to come back to to haunt some of these groups that have uh, sort of really embraced it and, and try, try to adjust their their businesses around it uh, because a lot of it is frankly a lot of greenwashing um, we like to our, our view as an and I'm looking at this from an explorationist point of view obviously that's what we do uh, we like to work on the ground with local communities and we have the good fortune in Alaska of, of being well established here um, uh, you, you, we're gonna, I know we're going to talk about politics as well, but uh, regardless of you know the fact of you're in, in the United States and it's a rule of law, if your local community doesn't like your project, you're screwed. So uh, you got our our motto is always meet early, meet often, be transparent, and listen. And I think those are the again I'm talking about from an, uh, an explorationist uh, and an exploration company development stage company point of view which is where we that's what we do you know we typically would bring in the big company to uh, you know to build the mine and execute the the, the plan which is what we've done with Don and on on with Eric when I did with trilogy in South 32 um, and effectively what we've done with Kinross and which to just use their mill up the road and and so we don't have to build a mill in the tailing facility and so our share of capital is fifty-five million dollars, rather than a hundred. You know, rather than a share of six or seven hundred million dollars of capital. So, but that all doesn't go anywhere if you're. My view of ESG, working with local communities, um, is off is often going in a bad direction. So, uh, to me, that's where we focus our efforts. Um, I'm proud to say that you know, in the context of. Uh, the broader view of ESG and and, and uh, climate change and carbon emissions, our, our plan actually has about a thirty percent reduction in carbon emissions, CO two emissions uh, than if we had built a mine and a mill in a tailing facility ourselves. So, those are all things that are are you know come with an overall executing an overall strategy. But to me, it's all about working closely with the local communities. Uh, Doug, I want to pose the same broad range of questions to you. Obviously, gold explorer, gold producer in Mexico, various aspects of ESG. Uh, feel free to take it wherever you want. Yeah, I mean, it, it is important. Um, one can't turn a blind eye to, to industry trends like that. Um, it's also a, an additional cost, but um, uh, no doubt, which is going to be exacerbated in the current environment. I'm a big believer, uh, at least on the, the environmental and social, uh, that what's important is the people, your local stakeholders, how they view you. You know, it's Mexico has a permitting environment where you have to, you're forced to start with social license. Now, you can lose that social license if you don't approach things on the ground properly, um, but you're forced to. Uh, we're in a world where it's all about ESG scorecards on websites and PowerPoint presentations to appease people, and you have to because it can impact your cost of capital. And uh, but, but I still think the most important part of it is how you approach your stakeholders on the ground, how you are seen as a corporate citizen in a country. Um, that that to me is where you're making a, a real impact. When, when you, when you, whether it's Mexico, Peru, Alaska, or whatever, you have an opportunity to impact the local people in a very positive manner. That's, that's what drives me. That's what drives Monero. Um, that's what we'll be proud of. Uh, you know, the funny thing is we're going to go from zero mines to three mines over the next four or five years. You know, our carbon footprint has to increase. You know, our baseline was zero mines. So, you know, I think you know, we'll obviously do everything we can that's environmentally sensitive, um, you know, to the the locations we're working in and sensitive to the communities at large. But, uh, you know, I, I can't pull the wool over anyone's eyes and say we're going to be reducing our carbon emissions. The nice thing about open pit heat bleach is it's not, you know, a major energy intensive kind of operation. So, um, you know, I 
you know, I'm I'm open minded to the fact that we we have to embrace this ESG, you know, world. But uh, but I I tend to scorecard ourselves internally rather than project it as some great thing we're doing. Um, it's that it's that relationship with our local stakeholders which is important to me. Finally, Ali, same question. So uh, I would well, uh, I, question. I would echo uh, CSR being you know around. Sorry, Ali, you're cutting out. Gentlemen, can you hear Ali, or am I the only one who is no. hearing him? No, he's fixed on my screen. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think we're going to have to move on. We'll return to Ali uh, when he returns to us. Uh, I, I just want to comment myself uh, on ESG. I've had the opportunity to talk to some of the largest uh, institutional investors in the world in the last five years about the topic. And I've asked them to consider things like, is the transfer of technical skills by a mining community to a local community a social good? Uh, is the fact that 1.2 billion people on Earth don't have primary access to electricity and another 2 billion people on Earth have access to only intermittent or unaffordable electricity uh, uh, an S factor? Uh, should uh, materials be produced in countries where there's a better form of environmental law than in other countries. Uh, it, it would seem that everybody's uh, analysis of ESG is different when, as an example, the World Economic uh, uh, Forum talks about ESG. They don't seem to talk about the fact that 1.2 billion people on Earth don't have access to primary electricity. They don't seem to talk about the fact that 800 million people uh, experience periods of time during the year when their aggregate calorie consumption is less than 1,000 calories per person per day. And my own two cents is that when we talk about ESG, we have to talk about ESG in its broadest possible perspective. Ali, you're back with us. Uh, I am, and I apologize. You were talking about power and access to power and, you know, the, the, the <laughs> have, have lots. I'm in downtown Toronto, uh, just off <laughs> Adelaide. You've lost power. So I have not back on my cell phone, and uh, here we are. So... Um, Long story short, I think, you know, I was covering off the ESG aspect of yep. things as far as uh, what we've been doing in Mongolia. I think uh, we've been in country for about 13 years now. Uh, my chairman's first foray there was a coal company. When he exited, we had uh, 299 local employees, one expat. Um, the other company that I was involved with is Stepgold, uh, another company that has uh, a fair number of uh, local Mongolian nationals working for the organization uh, with one expat. And with Ion Energy in uh, much the same fashion, uh, you know, the vast majority, uh, in, in fact, 100% of our people on the ground are Mongolian. Uh, we continue to meet with the local communities to ensure that we have the environmental sign off. Uh, but you look at the carbon footprint, which I think was uh, an overarching theme uh, with respect to, uh, respect to our, our other panelists here. Uh, China today imports the vast majority of their lithium from LATAM and from Australia. Um, think about the carbon footprint related to this clean green energy revolution as opposed to being able to find lithium on the doorstep of the largest consumer. So I think that environmental aspect might be uh, uh, resolved as a result of uh, where we are located. Uh, but in terms of uh, social license as well as governance, um, I think uh, these are things that uh, CSR sort of taught us. Uh, ESG continues to be a buzzword and uh, does indeed, as Doug mentioned, allow you to access capital. Uh, but uh, it's sort of the ethos of how we have operated before this was a buzzword. So uh, without power on my cell phone in downtown Toronto, over to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, since since I sort of have you still, I'm going to start the next question with you sure. uh, for fear that uh, that third world country, Canada, will fail you again with regards to power. Uh, and I want to talk about political risk and jurisdictional opportunity. Uh, obviously, you've operated around the world. You're operating in Mongolia now. Uh, talk to us about the political risk or the opportunity that you see uh, and focus on Mongolia, focus on Canada, focus on whatever you want. I want to hear a discussion of how political risk and jurisdictional opportunity uh, yeah. impacts your corporate thinking and strategy. Of course, I think I think that has a lot to do with where you opt to be, to do business, and uh, with Mongolia uh, being the jurisdiction that we operate in over the last thirteen years, uh, we've seen governments change uh, from the People's Party to the Democratic Party, and then back again. Uh, we've been uh, visiting country for well, I have at least for the last six years, and I've met with different members of government on both sides of both political parties. Uh, we've also seen now that Mongolia has opened up uh, their jurisdiction to. Uh, 
uh, foreign investment, not only from the Chinese, which is uh, something that they've never done historically. So in December, they had an opportunity to invite Chinese investment. Uh, Zijin invested in Xanadu Mines, a co copper explorer there. Uh, we know that Rio Tinto is uh, almost doubling down on their uh, investment for Oyu Tolgoi. Uh, so we see Mongolia as a jurisdiction that is opening up. Uh, yes, there is risk, unlike uh, every other jurisdiction on the planet. But I think uh, Mongolia is well positioned now to bring in foreign investment. And they've uh, sort of put their money or their, their, uh, uh, they're behind everything that they say they uh, are promising to our, our, our foreign investors. So with uh, Rio Tinto essentially putting $5 billion back into the economy, uh, that speaks to us as a jurisdiction that uh, would be quite profitable as we uh, progress. So you've been there 13 years, but you live in Canada. Uh, in terms of, as an example, social rents, fiscal terms, fiscal stability, how would you compare Mongolia and Canada? I think Canada, from a permitting perspective, can be quite difficult to operate in. Um, Mongolia, much the same, and I think environmental uh, so, sort of uh, sign-offs that you are required to have uh, as an operating company in Mongolia, uh, you sometimes have to get approval every quarter. Um, I think Canada is uh, uh, at the forefront of mining and has been, um, despite uh, it being a third world country that doesn't have electricity in downtown Toronto currently, but <laughs> uh, I, I think Mongolia is, is, a, is a nation that we can uh, draw parallels with respect to Canada, but I think uh, Mongolia is, is, is a Buddhist nation that uh, values their environment. So you do have to, in fact, uh, get approvals from the necessary individuals to, to operate in country. Uh, and how about the dis difference in fiscal terms, taxation, resource rents, things like that? Taxation, I think, you know, the, the good thing about Canada is, is the grants that you would receive uh, should you have assets in Canada. And uh, obviously we operate in Mongolia and uh, there have been a number of occasions in which uh, I've been uh, sort of approached uh, by uh, the innovation uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, ministry here in Canada for grants. But of course, we operate in Mongolia and that's not something we can do. Uh, as far as the fiscal terms are concerned, taxation, you know, uh, look at gold. Mongolia. Um, they're currently paying a premium to spot because they want to uh, ensure that their currency uh, you know, holds up well against uh, the inflationary measures that are happening around the world, but also uh, with respect to the, the grain crisis. So I think uh, taxation terms are quite favorable uh, in Mongolia as far as operating. Doug, I want to move on to you. Uh, political risk, jurisdictional opportunity. Yeah, uh, I think the two biggest challenges facing our sector are water management and permitting risk. And so permitting speaks directly to, to the question. Um, you know, where we are in Mexico, I guess, when AMLO came into power uh, right before COVID uh, hit, you know, it was the start of what seems to have been a trend in, in more left-leaning governments throughout South America now. And... You know, in that regard, I'd look at Africa. It's funny, um, we're not exposed to Africa. Sometimes I look at Africa and I go, when they resolve things, it's done with a coup and it's like business business continues. The spice must flow to put my bit of a do nerd hat on. Um, but there's some disruption and things things move forward again. And, and when you're dealing in Latin America and you're seeing a lot of these shifts to more left-leaning sides, you know, you can be stuck with that political ch winds of change for four to six years. Um, you know, that being said, where we are in Mexico, um, nothing much has changed under the AMLO government. Um, I think he's got about two and a half years left, so maybe there's still a chance that things will, will, will change. But, um, uh, you know, there's been whether it be Orla or Silvercrest or ourselves, you know, we've all built mines under under the AMLO government. Um, you know, and in that regard, I think we're we're quite happy with where we are. Um, one thing I'd say with regard to permitting and and maybe making comparisons, say between Canada and countries like Mexico that have a relatively short permitting window in comparison. Um, when you're building your first mine, there's that that old adage about being stuck in the orphan period of the, the development curve and no one wants to touch you because it's all boring permitting news construction or whatever to me you only live that orphan period once so you might as well live it in a country where it's actually pretty rapid to permit get up and running you know any 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 producer and we're a producer should be looking to de-risk by being a multi-asset producer and further de-risk by being a multi-jurisdiction producer as well, not getting crazy and being in seven different countries at once, but you can approach 
uh, a longer permitting environment somewhere else because you're not really in the orphan period. It's just development at that point. It's just the future. So, um, you know, to me, when I go back to those two biggest challenges facing our sector, I mean, uh, permitting is good in Mexico. Uh, water, uh, more problematic because we've been in two years of a La Nina event, which is, you know, we've seen it obviously in, in Southern California and, and, and it extends into Northern Mexico. Water is a challenge. Um, but uh, historically speaking, going back over 70 years, virtually every La Nina event had maybe a, a, up to a two and a half year period. So we're, we're hopefully, and California is hopefully almost through the worst of it. So, Rick, same question. Uh, political risk, jurisdictional opportunity. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're in the U.S., so, you know, uh, I, I think relatively low on the, on the political risk uh, scale. But, you know, I, I've worked all over the world and... Uh, um, I've enjoyed working all, all over the world as a young, ge younger geologist, but I'm an older geologist now, and uh, I'm going to stick a little closer to home, and I'm also going to stick on the road system. So uh, we're, you know, we, we found we found Donlin, and it's in the middle of nowhere, and it's it still struggles to uh, get permitted and to I don't know how it's going to get financed. Maybe it will, but it's a great deposit. But um, uh, so I'm I'm sticking close to infrastructure. Uh, I, I like to work where I know how to work. Um, we know how to work in the U.S. We know how to work in Canada. Uh, that's probably where, where we're going to stay. It's not without risk, um, but uh, we understand the risk, I, I think, is the way I would, would frame it. And I, and I also get back to sort of the ESG part of the, the discussion where you, I think you can really uh, improve your, your risk in terms of permitting and in terms of your social license by doing a good job with local communities and having local community supports, hearing their concerns, addressing their concerns. In our project, the, the mine at Mancho is not hardly at all, there's hardly any controversy about the mine site itself. The controversy any was about trucking. And, and so we've addressed that by, these will be the safest trucks on the road. They're gonna be fit for purpose trucks. So that's, I think that's how you have to mitigate you know, political risk is, understanding how there's going to be risk understanding how to execute uh is was kind of where we want to focus any comment on the biden administration's uh intercession with regards to trilogy on the road yeah i mean obviously unfortunate i mean i, I would have thought seven years of permitting was sufficient and you know literally hundreds of meetings with communities um it's a disappointment to see that uh, on basically every everything that happened under the Trump administration undone. Um, that doesn't sort of smell like rule of law, but um, we'll just deal with that separately. But um, I think it's important from for that for the Ambler Road is that the, the the permit wasn't revoked; it was just remanded. So right. there's that means more studies. You know, let's do some more studies. We haven't studied culture cultural impacts enough, and we haven't studied uh, subsistence issues uh, enough. So, um, you know, it's not dead. It's just it's just going to take a little longer, which obviously that's the uh, that's the M.O. of the uh, anti mining lobby is to is to, you know, death by a thousand cuts. So, yeah, disappointing, but uh, it, it'll get done. And that's because of the, that there is a lot of local support for the project and you don't hear about it because you know right. the the anti-mining community tends to be much louder than the than the supporters uh finally uh the one thing that none of us have talked about is the potential specter of recession i think everybody sees on the supply side with regards to resources facing a supply cliff <clears throat> what happens if we face a demand cliff what are the probabilities very quickly uh, that you all see with regards to recession? Is it part of your consideration? And if so, how? Doug, I'm going to start with you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's almost inevitable and it's a question of how long it lasts. But um, uh, I, I think right now, you know, heading into whatever this recession looks like, uh, we were already dealing with a supply uh, cliff. It's, it's just you know, it's if it's delayed, it doesn't. I, to me, it doesn't matter too much because most of these projects take 10, 15 years to to develop anyway. I mean, uh, so does it hurt us in the short term? Um, 
you know, I think we've obviously seen that on the base metal side, perhaps more so than the gold side right now. I think uh, gold actually can benefit from from what's ahead. Um, copper, lead, zinc, all these other commodities, the demand for those is going to be coming back. Um, you know, it's just deferred a little bit. So uh, perhaps there's going to be shorter term pain in terms of, you know, we, we saw almost $5 copper and now we're at whatever it is, three sixty. dollars um, You know, I think gold's actually against all the headwinds this year, gold has actually performed you know, remarkably well, especially when you look at the the strength of the U.S. dollar. So, from a gold perspective, I have less concerns. Um, and honestly, if I was producing, you know, looking at developing copper mines or the like, I would have less concerns. Either, I, you know, we've we've underinvested in this space for so long that that supply cliff is still there. It's just been delayed by a few years. Is is my, my feeling on that. Uh, for the record, I certainly agree with that, although I am nervous about the near term. By near term, I mean <laughs> three to four year uh, impact of a demand cliff, too. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Ali, I'd like to ask you the same question. Uh, what do you think the probability of a recession is, understanding that you have no crystal ball? Uh, <laughs> and, and how does that uh, impact your plans around the lithium market in your own com company? I, I think recession, as, as Doug mentioned, is inevitable. Uh, it, it's something that's coming. Uh, but we've known through um, various cycles that when we do have a recession, governments tend to increase their expenditure. Uh, and that has translated uh, during the pandemic in particular to uh, the electrification of the world through their investment in uh, clean, green energy technology. And so in terms of recession and government expenditure, I think we'll continue to see a move towards uh, electrification. Uh, oil and gas sort of uh, taking a uh, back seat relative to, to EVs. And uh, as a result of recession and government expenditure, you can incentivize individuals to, to move over to electric vehicles through subsidies and what have you. So I think as far as lithium is concerned, uh, I wouldn't call it recession proof. Nothing is uh, because people will start to, to, to really watch their pocketbook. Uh, but ultimately, if governments start to increase expenditure to, to stimulate the economy and have one of those mandates uh, being electrification, I think that bodes well for lithium uh, going forward. Ali, do you think that uh, a recession would impact government's ability to subsidize uh, industries like lithium? Uh, and do you have any uh, nervousness about the potential impact of recession on capital markets, capital availability, and hence your cost of capital? Absolutely. I think uh, the cost of capital and, and access to capital today is is quite difficult. So if you're in, in the junior mining space and you're looking to raise equity at uh, in today's environment, it's a, it's a difficult place to be in. Uh, thankfully, as far as we're concerned, we are a funded company that was able to complete a bot deal last year. But I think in the junior mining space in uh, particular, I think... Uh, this recession will be quite difficult uh, with respect to allowing anybody to access funds or capital to, to, to progress their projects. Uh, I would point out to the people listening to this phone call that I'm now a retired investor and have capital available. So to the extent that uh, somebody out there deserving issuer uh, and is willing to compete for capital, uh, I'm an active check writer. Uh, Rick, <laughs> Rick, let's move on to you. Uh, what do you see uh, in terms of the probability of a recession? Does your crystal ball give you a sense of timing and severity? And how is that impacting what it is that you're doing around Contango? Yeah, I mean, I, I actually think we're in a recession already in the U.S. Um, and uh, I think uh, we're in a, a global I think we're headed to a global recession, which um, I, I think has uh, more long, longer term uh, impacts. And and uh, so I, but I see that over the next you know couple of years, governments will do what governments do, and uh, and they'll bail 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 that out, bail uh, the bail the industries out, and put more money to work. China party being the leader in that. So. Um, I think when and all those things are really good for gold. So. <laughs> I think uh, I think it's uh, the recession's real. I think we're we're already in it. I think we're starting to see the gold price um, sort of disconnect from that strong dollar uh, opposition that it's, that it's had recently. You know, it's we had super strong dollar uh, for a whole variety of reasons, and I, I, I think we're going to see uh, gold uh, perform really well over the next uh, next two to three years. 
I think do you, copper for base metals. Do you have a concern uh, about the potential impact of recession on the cost and availability of capital, or the or the ability that governments might have to? Uh, I guess the phrase that they prefer to use is assist the mining industry. Yeah, I, I do think that's going to be problematic for uh, on the base metal side, uh, and that I'm talking more worldwide than you know than you. <laughs> Uh, again, for us, because we don't need to raise a lot of capital, I'm, I'm less, you know, we sold capital to raise, but it's not a big number in, in relative to our market cap, relative to the anticipated cash flow. I, you know, I can see, I can see us getting to the other side, but uh, I think we're going to go through a, a couple of years of, of tough, tough times for uh, for the mining industry in general, and for the junior junior sector specifically. Uh, you'll notice I didn't ask myself that question, uh, given that my background is credit. Uh, I'm perpetually nervous, uh, and I, I seem to have correctly called, absolutely correctly called, 17 of the last three recessions. So, uh, <laughs> Dasha, if you're standing by, I can't see questions from the audience, but if you see any questions that yeah. you think are particularly appropriate, perhaps uh, you could take over in the small time that we have left, and if there's a, a way to synthesize several questions in the one, ask it. Sure, um, but if you just want to click the Q&A button on the, on the right-hand side. Under published, you should see a, a, a lot of questions coming in. Uh, I just I want to make sure that we uh, use the last 10 minutes appropriately. So whichever questions I, you feel. I don't see that, I'm afraid. I see Q&A. And then click and published. Okay. Ah, thank you. There you go. Perfect. Uh, you see, there's another risk, which is to see uh, an inadvertent Luddite as commentator. Uh Okay, yeah, let's take the first one. Uh, NIMBYism. Uh, this doesn't impact all of you, but what about the circumstance? The questioner talks about Twin Metals, uh, Nouveau Monde. Uh, what about the impact of NIMBYism, the fact that uh, the world needs more materials, but many people don't seem to want those materials uh, harvested uh, near you. This will be an interesting question in perhaps in particular to ask with the three of you, given the sort of far flung nature uh, of where you are. Doug, let's start with you. NIMBYism. Are jobs more important than the unsightly nature of an open pit in Western Mexico? Well, I mean, here's the thing. Like there's there's been a lot of really good disruptive technology that has helped mining. Um, but in reality, we are still you know, using 18th, 19th century technology, which is big, digging big holes in the, in the earth, uh, especially when you look at something like copper. Um, so I, I think what's going to be fascinating playing out over the coming years is that battle that the environmentalists, the NIMBYs, what, are going to have to have in their, in their, uh, with themselves almost, that for the very metals to be created that can prove provide technological, climate, societal change for the better. We're going to have to get used to the fact that there's going to be some small disruptions to the Earth's surface. And this Earth's surface, and it's incumbent on companies to be able to make sure that that disruption of the Earth's surface with these big holes that we, we dig uh, is done in an in a environment, environmentally sensitive way, as much as a big hole in the Earth can be. Um, so I think that that is a battle We've kind of seen it play out with energy, you know, in Europe of, of late. I, I think largely the mining sector um, needs to have better clarity on permitting timelines. And the very people that are upset about mining need to be better educated, better informed by us as a sector as to why we are actually the solution for a lot of the problems that they're looking to have resolved. It just needs a few big holes. Many of you know I'm a recent refugee of the People's Republic of California, <clears throat> which uh, loves to drive but won't drill. Uh, <laughs> the idea that this dichotomy might be resolved rationally seems problematic to me, but again, I'll uh, stop editorializing. Uh, Rick, I suspect that there's nobody in your backyard uh, where you are proposing to build your mind, but do you see NIMBYism uh, as an issue in rural Alaska? Oh, uh, very much so, um, and it's it's a weird kind of nimbyism because uh, 
the NGOs think that Alaska is their playground, and uh, uh, that's that's their view. They don't they don't want mining. There's groups that don't want mining. Um, there, and it, but it's mostly funded from the outside. Um, sure. the, the Alaskans, and by and large, are are very very supportive of of all resource development and believe that you can have mining and have a, a healthy fishery and have forestry and have tourism. I mean, those are our businesses up here. Um, Alaskans believe that, and, and we have we do it. We do everything very well. Uh, we're one of the lowest carbon emissions. Uh, uh, oil and gas operators in the world. So we can do it. Um, the education piece that Doug was talking about, that's that's a tough one. Um, it's hard to educate people who want to remain ignorant um, or or just want to put a blind eye to it. Um, it's, it's what we have to do. I'm participating next week in a critical metals conference here hosted by the University of Alaska in Fairbanks. Uh, it's the third one that we've had in the last uh, six or seven or eight years. Um, and what's disappointing, it's nice that we're having it, um, but it's disappointing that when I look back at the, the first one we had seven or eight years ago, nothing has changed. There are there are no new roads. There is no new power power system in Alaska. We have plenty of green energy opportunities, but they always get shut down. Um, and, you know, you can't even mention the word nuclear up here. Just uh, and again, it's not Alaskans. It's outsiders. So, um, yeah, it's a combination of, uh, of uh, energy. And quite frankly, I think it's it's uh, it's all this dark money that's uh, floating around uh, financing, financing things, uh, financing NGOs to have a, to take a position. Uh, we have no idea where that where this money comes from. Is it just wealthy billionaires from California, or is it China and Russia? I have no idea. I think, Ali, I think uh, you look into, but big question. Al, Ali, nimbyism in Mongolia, is it an issue uh, for you? Or you could you could do Ontario, yeah, too. If you want. I'm going to touch uh, on a number of things. I think Doug and Rick both uh, talked uh, to education. I think that's a big part of uh, the gap that we see in our industry. You know, when we went to high school or university, uh, we never learned about mining. Uh, mining is an industry that we sort of fall into uh, with respect to uh, the potential for us to, to not only make capital, but uh, perhaps we were geologists or what have you. But beyond that, I think the vast majority of individuals that work in mining uh, never learned about it until they sort of uh, happened to come across it as an industry. So that's the education front. <clears throat> beyond that, I think NIMBYism, you look at Yadar in Serbia. Uh, that that was a lithium project that would have gone online, that would have helped uh, to, to bring supply online in Europe, that would have uh, helped Norvolt and a number of other companies uh, have access to lithium. Uh, but people didn't want that environmental footprint. Where we stand, Mongolia, Mongolia being a very nomadic nation, uh, where individuals essentially move their livestock from location to location, uh, feeding them or, or uh, getting access to water, uh, evaporation ponds would not be feasible. And I've said that from the onset. I think evaporation ponds are, are, are very uh, environmentally damaging. Uh, it's not something that we would want to do as a company. And with the advent of DLE, you know, you, you can sort of uh, avert some of that nimbyism and ensure that you're having a smaller footprint that doesn't have uh, a, a massive sort of uh, scar on the environment. Uh, and that's sort of my view. Gentlemen, I want to thank and congratulate you. I gave you admonitions at the beginning of this session that you had to give me concise uh, answers. And amazingly, uh, we have acquitted ourselves fairly well with regards to that. We've dealt with six serious topics. I think we've dealt with them in serious fashion. And nobody, uh, I think, went over budget with regards to time. So finally, what I'd like you to do is I'd like each of you to uh, tell, your, tell our listeners uh, how they might contact you and how they might learn more about your company. Doug, let's start with you. Um, sure. Uh, I put my cell number, stupidly or not, on the bottom of every one of our Monero Alamos press releases because I think it's really important to, to make oneself available to shareholders and potential shareholders alike. Uh, so at moneroalamos.com, uh, you can find that. Uh, along with all our materials with regard to our new gold producer uh, that we've we've formed. Um, and I look forward to many a conversation on topics that might be Monero related or mining related. As I said, I think as a sector, we, we have to do a better job of educating people. And that doesn't always mean talking about ourselves. Rick, same question. How do people find you? 
Yeah, uh, so our, uh, our web address is contangoor.com, and, and like Doug, I put my uh, cell numbers at the bottom there, so uh, give me a call and ask questions. Uh, love to share the story with you. Uh, we think it's a pretty unique story. And uh, I'd like to thank you, Rick, for hosting this and, uh, and doing a great job moderating. Thanks very much. Always a pleasure. And Ali, uh, how do people learn more about you and find you? Absolutely. Uh, much like Doug, I'm one of those rare breeds that answers my phone uh, at all hours. And I do give my phone number out to just about everybody. It's on the press releases as well. So ionenergy.ca is our website. Uh, get in touch. And uh, thank you very much, Rick, and uh, my fellow panelists for, for this interesting conversation. Always a pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the best possible answer. You want to hear about the company? Call the CEO. If he or she won't take your call, don't buy the stock. Pretty simple. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much. Uh, Dasha, we're done with the first hour. Let's move on to the second.